Hi there, grave growers. Before we get into the interview today, I just wanted to honor and call attention to the protests happening right now in response to the police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and countless other Black Americans. I'm a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, have been protesting and taking action here in Chicago, and like many of you, I am trying my hardest to stay present and not look away as voices that have been politically and socially suppressed bring their grief to the surface for all of us to see. By no stretch of the imagination am I any kind of expert on what it's like to be Black in the United States. The only authority I have alongside the Black Lives Matter movement is a witnessing and holding of the individual, collective, racial, and ancestral grief that's being aired right now in America. This is a grief event, and it is my hope, grief growers, that you will participate in some way by protesting, donating, writing, and calling your elected officials, or by simply listening to and holding space for Black voices. This week and into the future, I'll be calling attention to Black voices and Black grief with more intention and frequency here on Coming Back and on my social media platforms. The grief space is notoriously white, but I know that there is far more to grief than the white stories that are packaged and sold on shelves. Please know that Black grief does not negate white grief by any means, but white people, including me, have never faced grief as a result of our skin color. I challenge you to cultivate radical empathy, my white listeners, in doing your best to comprehend an experience you will never fully understand. Allow your heart to break, and know that whatever is coming up for you, sadness, despair, rage, shame, guilt, and uncomfortableness, are all appropriate. They are signs that your heart is working properly. And then after your heart breaks, grief growers, take meaningful action, and keep taking meaningful action. Several grief professionals I know refuse to combine politics with their work in the grief space for fear of offending or minimizing the voices of people who disagree. But that's not a qualm that I have. The political and the personal are both saturated with grief, and to my mind there is no such thing as a separation of politics and grief. I believe that Black Lives Matter and that Black Grief matters. If you'd like to connect on ways you can support Black people now and in the future, please email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. By no means do I have all of the answers, but thanks to my circle of friends and living in a very visible protest city, Chicago, I have some wonderful places for you to start. I selected to air this week's interview with Lindsay Whistle Fenton because the project she is here to share, the Speaking Grief documentary now on public television stations nationwide, features a wide array of griefs, voices, and backgrounds with expert commentary from therapists and grief practitioners of diverse skin colors and experiences. This is not another portrait of white grief, but a full spectrum look at how grief impacts all of us. I hope you'll find Speaking Grief on your local television station or online when it's available. Please know that I am sitting with you now, grief growers, as our world continues to break open. In this year of unrest, uncertainty, and unknownness, something is happening. We are all acknowledging our grief in the midst of our humanness. It's true that we all grieve differently, but we all grieve. Thank you so much, as always, for listening to Coming Back. Hi there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after death, divorce, diagnosis, and more. Today, I'm speaking with producer, writer, and director Lindsay Whistle Fenton about the new public television documentary, Speaking Grief, which aims to jumpstart conversations on grief and loss in a society that treats grief as taboo. We'll be touching on how we can get more comfortable in awkward moments, how we can open the door for others to share their grief, and some helpful scripts to help you get started in your own conversations on loss. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide and author who speaks, writes, and teaches powerful truths on grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief 
and I use what I learned to create a world where grief is welcomed, normalized, and even embraced. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Lindsay Whistle Fenton is a senior producer at WPSU, the PBS affiliate station for Central Pennsylvania. She is the producer, writer, and director of the documentary Speaking Grief, part of a new public media initiative aimed at creating a more grief aware society. You can find out more about Speaking Grief and find your local air date at speakinggrief.org or by following WPSU Grief on Instagram and Facebook. Lindsay, I'm really delighted to welcome you to Coming Back because your project, Speaking Grief, is all about doing grief better. And not only doing grief better, but making grief accessible to people that are grieving, but also people that are not. Like we don't necessarily need to be grieving to get better at grief. I think it's something that um, that all of us are able, should be willing <laughs> to do. Um, so can you share a little bit more about what Speaking Grief is and kind of what your inspiration was for the project? Absolutely. So it's it's funny because we are all grieving, really. But um, especially right now, I think uh, with everything going on with the pandemic, we're we're re- really it's really getting hammered home that we all grieve so many different things, um, but we just maybe don't always recognize or name that as grief. Um, so speaking grief is a project that actually started. I think I started work on this maybe three or four years ago when we first started researching and developing it. And unfortunately it has become all the more timely right now with everything going on. But it originally uh, was the idea of a colleague of mine. Her name was Patty Satalia. She's since retired to do uh, some sort of a project about grieving the loss of a child. And we started researching and developing that idea. And I came on board pretty early and there, you know, fits and fits and starts of getting it off the ground, but it became apparent really quickly that the need for this was huge, and it was also so much bigger um, that we needed to really look at this, and that there's shockingly there wasn't much in the way of content out there in the mainstream anyway that directly took on grief. Um, I think something I started appreciating since doing this work is how much grief shows up in things and in our pop culture, but we don't always, you know, explicitly say, Hey, this person's grieving, or this is, this is about grief. So really just looking at grief, um, there wasn't anything. And then seeing how much need there was in terms of people not feeling like they were being held or supported by their people um, in the way that they really needed, you know, in kind of their, their darkest moments was really powerful to see that gap. Um, and I, and I can talk about some of my own losses, but I haven't yet because I recognize it's a part of life. I haven't yet lost kind of one of my, one of my immediate family members or close friends. Um, my losses have been, um, you know, a, a couple circles out from that. So I think I came at this more as the perspective of a potential support person. And I just, Like, I know we all have been there where we just, we care so much and we love our people and we really, really want to do something for them, um, but we just don't know what to do. And so we just really, a lot of times fumble it and, you know, and then even worse sometimes because we fumble or we're afraid of fumbling, we just totally vanish and seeing how much unintentional hurt and damage that does uh, both in my research and then in, in the work on the project, um, it was really, really devastating. And so our team felt that that was where we could add the most value to this project was really building up our sort of grief, grief savvy or grief awareness and um, with, throughout our society and just getting people a little bit more comfortable with how they even begin these conversations or how they can get better and, and more comfortable showing up um, for whoever it is in their life that's grieving and needs that support. And something I love about this project immediately is this notion of getting better at grief, but it's not about taking any of the awkwardness away. It's like, how do we become comfortable in the awkward? Because there's really no, I I think people have this illusion that that one day I'll be so good at grief, it won't be weird anymore. I'm like, no, it's going to always be weird. Um, and I love that you're coming at it from this this support person 
perspective. We've never had this happen on coming back before where the person telling the story is not um, someone with a major grief or loss story of their own. And there's this sense of, gosh, I want to help. I want to know what to say, but I'm so afraid of tripping over my tongue or saying the wrong thing or offending somebody that that it's just better to stay silent um, and really breaking down that myth and those walls. Yeah. And we're really all about the kind of own your awkward. That's um, it's, I think that's the number one thing is just so much of this is, is it's bigger than just grief. And I want to say too, in our, we focused in our project on death related grief um, because grief is so huge that we needed to have some sort of way to, um, to pick a focus and, and go from there. But as I said in the beginning, everybody's grieving something. So I think we can all identify to some extent, but when you're in those really, you know, big loss spaces, it is awkward. And it's even if you've had losses, you know, I've talked to some of the the families who've had those major losses or those out of order losses. And they'll still say, you know, people think that now I'm this expert and that I know what to say to somebody. And I, I don't know either because every loss is so different. And I think it really just starts from that place of being authentic, that it is uncomfortable and that, you know, it like, it sucks to watch somebody that you care about hurt and to accept that there's like literally nothing you can do to take that hurt away from them. Uh, so I think that's the, one of the key takeaways that I've taken from this and that I hope other people do is like, if we can just kind of, it sounds harsh, but like get rid of that notion of like, you're, you're not going to be able to cheer somebody up in this space. It's just not possible. And like shift that focus from your not trying to cheer them up or make it better because you actually can't and shift it to just make them feel supported and ensure that they're not alone and that you don't disappear. That's a, it's just a much more human and real space, I think, to come to it as a support person than I think from someone who's actually grieving and receiving the support. It takes that pressure off to have to perform and, you know, oh, okay, yeah, you cheered me up and now I'm happy. And then they leave and it's like, no, you really didn't, but I didn't want you to feel bad. Um, so I think it's really just about that sort of authentic dialogue and coming to things as you are and being okay with this saying that you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what to say, but that you want to be there and you're trying and, the, you know, that even if you feel super weird about it, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, I literally just wrote down, um, there's an admission of powerlessness. Like at some point, people who are supporting grievers have to admit that they don't have the power to make us feel better. Like that's not within their scope of power. What you do have the power to do is show up and speak and support and bring a casserole and offer to carpool and all these other, um, (laughs) all these other abilities. But I think so much of what, especially Westernized society uh, transmits to us or tries to integrate is that, yeah, there are ways to to fix or to cheer up instantly, like savior complex kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 We love to fix things. And I think I've really been reflecting on, you know, how we got to be so weird about this. And I think it is because we live in this, we love lists and we love like the, you know, the top 20 guidelines to nail grief support, you know, and and it's just a space. We had this challenge. um, So we made the documentary, but we've also built a website with some some instruction around this and working with our, our instructional designer, it we're like trying to distill what the goals are. And it's like, well, it's really hard because we can't really give people tangible, like do this and you will not fail things. I think the only thing that you can say without fail is be there rooted in love and be honest and authentic and humble because I think, yeah, the, the disappearance of that support out of the awkwardness is is so cruel. And I don't think we realize that. And again, it's not one thing we didn't want to do is we don't want to shame people. Like we, I understand, like I'll, so I'll share something that keeps coming up in my head um, throughout this project of like thinking about owning when we do make those mistakes is when I was like, I don't know, 22, 23, like I had just moved here. And I remember I was getting a sleep study done and the technician came in and he was, you know, wiring me up and everything. And he said, I'm, I'm really sorry if I seem out of it. My dad just died. And I was so, I felt so, so in such intense empathy. Um, and you know, I'm a daddy's girl and that just, it really, I felt for him, but I, I still remember that moment of just my brain 
feeling like it short circuited as I was like searching through this catalog of what I could say. And I didn't say anything. I didn't even say, I'm sorry. I don't even think I said, I'm sorry. And I, to this day, I feel so horrible about that, um, that experience. And I have always wanted to be able to go back and just say, my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't even acknowledge what you told me because I was so paralyzed by, yeah, this fear of that there is some right thing I could do. Or if I had said these right words to you, it would have made it all better that your dad died. And that's like, you know, I wish I had known what I know now, you know, back then. But even since then, I've been in positions I've had a number of times in the past few years since working on this project where I do know better. And you still go to those like go-to phrases that are the worst, but we're so programmed to say them. It's like you have to almost physically bite them back so you don't say the things, you know? I think you're pointing to a great revelation that a lot of grieving people (laughs) have, especially after they've experienced loss is like, oh man, I've said some really shitty things to people in the past. And only now that I'm a griever, I'm a member of the club. Do I actually recognize how bad that feels to hear? Um, I don't know that I have a specific example that's jumping up to my brain right away, but I know that, um, at least in my in my personal experience, before I lost my mom, I was very much, um, gosh, and this is oh, a hard admission to say, but I was almost a believer in this hierarchy of grief. Like if somebody mm-hmm. wasn't related to you, um, then the grief should not be so big. Like I didn't understand like loss of a best friend or uh, loss of a coworker or these things that were um, related to you, but not relational to you. And so it was like, I couldn't wrap my head around why that would be so bad. And even saying it now, I'm like, wow, Shelby, <laughs> you had no, no idea that, cause I, you know, I thought there was this hierarchy of, of the severity of grief. I thought it was especially bad to, to lose a child or a parent or a sibling or somebody that was immediately related to you, but like aunts, uncles, grandparents, best friends, coworkers, you know, fellow churchgoers, like the the circle radiated out. And for some reason you weren't supposed to feel quote unquote as bad when those things happened. And so I wouldn't comprehend uh, when people felt deep grief after losing these connections. And now I'm like, wow, Um, the invalidating of even just believing that, even if I never took action on that, but the invalidation of even believing that uh, to be true. is Well, we invalidate our own grief. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so sad too, is that, yeah, and I, I, I'm so grateful for being invited and trusted into the conversations that I had with people because I think it did, you know, it really was a privilege to get such candid dialogue going about such a personal topic. But it's really, obviously, it's eye opening. But it, I think it, it's like the the way we internalize that too. So I, and I'm with you, like, and thank you for being authentic and being vulnerable and open, you know, and sharing that that's where you came to it. Cause I, we're all guilty of that, I think. Um, you know, and I've obviously spent a lot of time thinking about grief and loss and, you know, I've thought like, God, my best friend, that would be one of the most devastating losses I could imagine. And I, I want to say in the film, we focused on family grief again, because we had to find some way to sort of scale what we were doing to make it manageable. And that's, not at all intended to say that that is the only valid grief. Um, Megan Devine, who's who's an author who's featured in the documentary, who we worked with closely, has something I love where she'll talk about how all grief is not the same, but all grief is valid. And, um, you know, from that internalizing place, my grandmother died in February. And I, again, have spent so much time working and thinking in the space. And I still found myself in what you were describing where you invalidate your own grief. And I was thinking, you know, she's 97. You knew, you know, it's your grandmother. You knew, you know, you're going to lose your grandparents. You expect that. And I've had the same thought where like when I lost, um, so I lost a grandfather when I was 10 that, you know, I was, I was really too young and I, I, it didn't hit me in the same way. And then I lost my other grandmother about four years ago. And that was, that hit me so much harder than I thought it would. And I had the same thing you described where I thought, geez, all my friends and coworkers in the past few years who've lost grandparents, it was sort of like, I didn't, I didn't understand. Um, And even I'll say pet loss (laughs) since something Mm -hmm. that's come out of this, um, this project is I I am now a, a not only proud, but probably crazy dog mom. Um, I, we adopted a rescue dog. Um, My husband and I shortly before I really delved into this project in, in part because I sort of wanted this little 
um, emotional support creature because I knew it was going to be pretty heavy and partly because it was something we'd talked about for a while and being in the space made me really think, you know, we don't know if next year is going to be, we're going to be around to get a dog. So let's get a dog. But that, you know, we've gone through a few health scares with her and I'm a wreck. <laughs> and, you know, I think of all my friends, we never had pets growing up and, uh, and people I know who've lost a pet. And I would think, geez, it's just a dog or just a cat. And now I'm like, oh my God, I'm a terrible person because now I understand, you know, how much love there is there. So yeah, it's just, it's just that empathy. And so much of it is like, yeah, until you're there, it's like, it's like we ignore it until we don't have a choice. Yeah. And something else that's coming up for me right now is also this acknowledgement of hope, because if I could change my mind and you could change your mind, then other people who don't know how to do grief have the capacity to change their minds. Like there is, um, there's an innate potential, I think in each of us to re understand grief um, and how to approach people that are grieving. So when we have those situations, like in that lab where the guy's like, my dad died and you're scrolling through this index of your brain, like, what do you say for grief? Error 404, not found. <laughs> like all of a that. sudden we'll have this index of, okay, this is something to reach for. This is something to reach for. Even just saying, I'm sorry. So it's like, okay, transmission received. I have, I'm acknowledging that you're grieving right here. And right now there is a potential for growth because I think something that especially a lot of grievers, including myself feel in the immediate aftermath of loss, especially is that if people aren't, if the people around us aren't doing grief well at first, they will never do grief well. Like they will mm. never come back to us and apologize for their behavior. They'll never say they're sorry that they weren't there for us. They'll never, um, they'll never try again. And, and some of them don't. And I'm, I want to fully and wholeheartedly acknowledge that right now that sometimes there are friends that disappear. There are family members that shut down your grief and continue to sh try to shut it down for the rest of their life and your life. Um, and simultaneously, I know that I have approached people who I've not done grief well with, and I've been approached by people who did not do grief well for me. Um, and it has not undone what was said, but it has reestablished the fact that there's a bridge between us and it's worth walking across. Um, so very almost like hopeful in knowing that <laughs> our stupidity or insensitivity has become knowing and sensitivity around grief, because if it happens to us, that means it can happen for a lot of other people as well. Um, I kind of want to shift gears and talk about the actual experience for you of working on speaking grief, a meeting with grieving families, meeting with experts and kind of um, what that was like to suddenly be so immersed in the topic of grief? Hmm. Yeah, it was, um, well, I'm kind of weird. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an introvert and I'm, but I'm an introvert who's, I think people misunderstand what that means. I like am profoundly curious about people and like existential things. So this is sort of like, it's a weird Thing to say like I love doing this but I love like the thing about introverts is like we don't like small talk so <laughs> it's like getting to sit down with people and just kind of cut to the very like essence of you know what makes people human which is which is your love and your pain and, and all that um it's weird to say like I love being in that space because it's a very hard and heavy space sometimes but in a way it was this real gift um and I made you probably experience this all the time is like when you interview someone, especially about personal things, you do make a weird kind of bond because I think sometimes, you know, it's easier to share with someone who doesn't have any real connection to your life and doesn't have, you know, know any of your baggage and, and you can just be open. So I, I definitely always have those connections. And then within this, um, I think even some stronger connections were made, but it was, um, it, it was heavy. Um, I think I really surprised myself. I'm also kind of, I would use the word maybe empath, maybe like I'm, I, I feel things pretty intensely, um, other people's feelings too sometimes. And so I knew going into this that I was going to have to, you know, kind of find a way to deal with that. And I think I, I was surprised by, you, you kind of get into your professional role and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I've done other kind of heavier projects before. So I, I knew going into it that I, I would be able to hold that space. And, and I, my rule is always like, I, I try not to be crying more than the people I'm interviewing. So every now and then, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight it if I were feeling, you know, if I was moved to tears by something they said, but I definitely didn't want the focus to ever shift to me. So I would allow myself to feel that with them. 
but then, you know, I have to kind of keep up some level of that, that professional boundary. Um, but then there were nights where, you know, certain things would, I'd be okay for three or four interviews and then something would just, you know, kind of penetrate that boundary. And I'd, you know, frankly, just go back to my hotel room and sob and give myself profession, like permission to do that. And that it's, you know, there's no shame in being moved by another human being's pain. Um, so I think that was, um, and that was, that's speaking about just even the filming of the interviews. And, you know, another part of this was, I think at last count, there was probably about 65 or 70 phone calls I made. And some of those ended up being people that we featured either in the, in some form in the projects, we have a documentary, but then we also have a lot of content that was produced exclusively for our website. Um, but there were a lot of conversations I had in the research phase that were, you know, hour, hour and a half long conversations by phone with people I actually never even got to meet in person. Um, and that was a good lesson in boundaries because I was, I, I, I didn't want to basically turn down any opportunity with someone who was willing to be vulnerable and share their story with me. So I would be taking calls at, you know, 11 o'clock at night because of time differences or six o'clock in the morning. And I, I did that leading up to the holidays. Um, and I was just, I was, um, I really ran, you know, kind of ran my battery low. And so that was, that was important that, um, to learn how to kind of set some sort of a, a self-care boundary, I guess. It also, you know, from a perspective of being able to be present with other people, because if you burn yourself down too much, you it, it's harder to hold that space for other people. But I think the biggest takeaway from all of those conversations was they would be so emotional often, you know, they would, they would get really intense and I would kind of end the conversation almost apologizing and say, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I stirred all this up for you, or, you know, I'm sorry, you know, that you're crying now. And and they would almost always come back and say like, no, I, thank you. Like I never ever get to talk about this. No one ever gives me this opportunity. And I think that was, that was sort of like we were talking about earlier is understanding that it's it, that shared pain isn't bad. Like it's to hear how I guess grateful people are just to have somebody asked them like for real how they're doing or to, to talk about it. Um, it was really eye opening that like, Oh yeah, we don't have to be scared of people crying or we don't have to be scared of, of bringing these feelings up because this is, this is what it is. <laughs> this is what grief is. This is what life is. And um, really kind of solidified the need to create spaces for those conversations to happen. I wonder as people who are bystanders to grief, whether we're actually grieving ourselves or not, um, what can we do to create more opportunities for people to share their grief? Because I've I've heard this a lot of, oh my gosh, no, thank you. I never get to share this. Um, and so opening up the door more and more often for people to talk about their pain. Yeah, it um it 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 is it is so needed. And this would, I've, I've told a few friends about this too. It would even happen like in Uber rides. Like I would, people would ask me what I was doing in town. I'd say I'm doing a documentary about grief and, you know, someone I really had no connection to would say, Oh my gosh, you should, you know, my mom died or my brother died and they would give me their whole story. And I just thought, wow, like we're so desperate for someone to just broach that topic. So I think some of it is just literally like talking about it, just saying, Oh, Hey, you know, I'm trying to think of how to, how to start those conversations, but it, it's, I wanted to go back. You said something earlier about changing minds. I don't even think it's that we need to change people's minds about how real grief is. I think the reality is people know. And I think that's actually why maybe we shy away from it is because mm -hmm. when you do open that space, you know, I've heard a lot of people say they don't like when people say, Oh, I can't imagine what you must be feeling. And the response is, well, you can, you just don't want to. And I think that's kind of, what it is. Like, I think any one of us can, can imagine and can go there to what it would feel like if we lost one of our core people. And it, it is so devastating and so scary that we put up that, that boundary of not letting it in. Um, and then that kind of unknowingly impedes our ability to offer that authentic support. So I, I don't think it's a changing mind. I think it's a, it's a, it's a breaking down wall thing. And encouraging vulnerability because I think so I think to 
be able to show up for somebody else. You kind of have to be willing to have that vulnerability yourself. Um, one from that awkward place of just like, I might come off sounding like a total idiot or I've learned, this is me speaking. Like I've learned that the, I'm just honest when I sit with people and I say like, I gosh, I really wish I knew what to say to you right now, but I don't, or, um, just simply validating that. Yeah, this sucks. Like <laughs> this, is, this really sucks. And I wish I, you know, I don't have anything better to say that like, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this. Um, you know, and, and actively stopping myself from saying anything beyond that. Um, so for other people, I think so much of it is just, I think you have to be, you have to almost kind of create the space though. It's like, you know, it's not the thing where it's like, oh, as I'm passing you, as we're walking our dogs and we're both like being pulled in other directions, probably isn't the best time to be like, oh, you know, how are you doing? <laughs> or, you know, um, have one of those intense conversations. But I think when you're like, you know, when it is like, you know, when there's enough space, when you're not going to be interrupted, when you have that ability to really sit with someone. Um, but, you know, I think one of the simplest pieces of, I hate the word advice, but advice is just like, just an authentic, how are you doing? And like, leave it there. And just, um, and if how they're doing is terrible. And, and I was listening to, um, I think it was your, your interview with Jan Warner of like, I'm not sure if I want to keep living right now. Like, holding that space and just not judging it and not trying to shut it down. Um, you know, it's not, and I think it's not that we can't ever voice real concern, but trying to stay out of that judgmental space. Um, and, um, another Megan divinism, she's again, uh, one of our advisors is, is approaching with curiosity and not judgment. Um, but you'll, you know, and I, it, it's it's funny as I'm talking to you, I'm like, I'm lecturing you on like how to hold space for, <laughs> for grief. I don't need to, you know, it's like, I'm like, I'm, I'm no more qualified than the next person to talk about this. But I think just the act of just sitting with someone in silence is, is you don't really need to say much. It's if they want to share something, it's going to come out. And if they don't, they're still being supported because they're not alone as they're crying or just sitting in silence. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I love that you continue to mention Megan Devine. She was one of the very first guests we had oh, on the she? show. Yeah. Um, I mean, back when coming back first started and in, in yeah. 2017, we had, we had a lot of great advisors, but yeah, I also just, I was, um, did an interview with Megan, um, where I interviewed her uh, a few days ago. So a lot of her, I call them like Meganisms are sort of fresh in my brain right now. Yes. Well, and her book, it's okay that you're not okay. Speak in such, um, such powerful snippets that like, yeah, I can put that in my pocket for later. Um, mm -hmm. And I love this, this notion of mm, we're not necessarily retraining people how to deal with grief or training them how to take the walls down and allowing yes. things to be awkward. I think um, so many people ask me what uh, quote unquote advice to give for sitting with somebody who's grieving and I think the best thing I've ever told somebody is to give a disclaimer before you say anything. Um, and not in the sense of, you know, I'm going to be really bad at this or something like that. But if you're texting or eat, like no need to respond right away, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking about you and I love you. I'm still here. If you want to talk or, um, you know, if you don't have time to answer this right now or check in, it's okay. Or, um, I'm so sorry that this is your life right now. I know I can't possibly understand. And so kind of, um, like I get how hard this is and I know that I can't possibly be in your shoes, but I'm beside you. Very, um, almost a reminder of companioning in a way. And some gravers will be grateful for that. And others, um, will see it kind of bitterly as like, yeah, there is no way to understand and it will emphasize the loneliness, but as much as you can, it's, it's something that can, gosh, there's a loneliness and an isolation and yet you're not alone. It's very paradoxical. Yeah. And it's because it is like, so, so many of the thoughts right now, <laughs> but I was thinking about um, a few things. One, I wanted to share that one of the, one of the families we interviewed, I really filed this away, you know, for myself for future uses. It, it was a family of a, they had a stillborn baby boy and the father said he really thought about the people who got it right for them. And it was the people who gave without expectation, like that, you know, would ring the doorbell, leave the food and not even expect that thank you or that conversation and who, who were consistent. So people who kept showing up 
But I think um, what, what you just said triggered a memory for me of, so my, this is what I mean by like, you know, we're all grieving something. So my mom's a two time breast cancer survivor and she, she went through her first round of treatment when I was 17. And I remember her telling me later, you know, when I was an adult that someone had told her, you know, you'll have all these people who will be there and love you and want to support you. But the end, at the end of this, nobody can walk this journey, but you, like you're still kind of alone in, in the experience and that, you know, it's, it's, I don't mean that in a harsh way, but it's like she said that really just kind of helped her frame that people would, no matter how much they loved her, would be there for her as much as they were able. But there were some things that that nobody else could carry for her, and that that you know made me think about thinking about um, breaking those walls down. And and one of the things I think is helpful is for people to start naming their little like daily griefs. And I, I don't mean little, but you know those kind of especially right now with all all of the things that we're collectively grieving but if we can start tapping into those and actually recognizing that that is a loss and maybe a grief experience you can start sort of filing that away you know so when I love your error 404 because that's perfect so like that the next time maybe you still might not have the right words because there may never be the right words but at least you'll be like oh I remember you know how crummy this felt that I was sad that you know this baby shower got canceled and that affected me in this way. And I know it's nowhere near on the same scale or the same level of tragedy, but I can pull a few of the feelings I felt out in that experience and, and maybe use that to crack that wall a little bit and start to let in what it might be on this huge, huge, massive scale of, of a death or, or some other great illness or tragedy. Yeah. It's like, um, it's not a perfect replication, but it's as close as you know how to reasonably get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, and that's where, you know, again, it's like, they're all grief is valid. It's not the same. Um, and I, I so love that you brought up that hierarchy of grief um, because we do do that. And it's like, I think it's, and I don't think we do a lot of this stuff because we're, you know, malicious or bad. It's just like, that's kind of how our brains work. And again, like our culture is like, we're really into like categorizing stuff and um, sorting things because it's, it's like efficient to do it that way. So it's, it's like, I'm not trying to, again, we're not trying to shame people. It's just, it's also, you know, we're recognizing the shared experience of grief that we'll all have, but it's also the shared experience of, of discomfort around feeling helpless and feeling, because that's, a, that's a hard truth to swallow of like that you actually can't do anything to take pain away from someone you care about. Um, but that you, you can still help by not going away. Yeah. And I wonder that kind of segues into my next question, which is um, if somebody's listening to this podcast and they're actively grieving and they're seeking that kind of support from the people around them, it's kind of a shame that the burden of asking falls onto the griever, but what mm -hmm. can they ask from the people around them? Like what can they reasonably ask for or expect from the people around them? I hate to have, I hate that people have to ask, but yeah, I recognize that that's a reality. Um, I would, I would, I guess, like hope and, and pray that people have someone in their life that they have that level of comfort with that. Like I know um, a very dear friend of mine and I, we have, we have been through a whole heap of life stuff together. Um, and, you know, we'll have very authentic conversations where sometimes she'll be saying something and, and I'll, I'll try to be fixing it or, you know, giving advice. And she'll just say, she'll stop me and she'll say, I just need you to listen. I don't need you to respond. Uh, and that, that's so like, you know, and you, you can't do that with everybody. You have to have that level of trust with someone. Um, cause then your other person has to be able to hear that and not be offended. Um, sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. Like, and so I think that's part of it on the support side is just being conscious of those times where you, you are trying to say the fixing stuff and it's not helping. Um, but yeah, from a, from a grief person, I think, um, I, <laughs> I'm struggling with this because I don't want to put any more burden on people who are already caring so much, but it's, you know, we are, some of us are like, we're kind of dense sometimes. So I think those little prompts, like if you have someone that you can be comfortable with of just saying, um, you know, maybe when people are offering to bring the meals or, or whatever it is to redirect, um, if that's helpful, just saying, you know, I, I, I don't really need you to do this, but you know, if you would just, chill with me for 20 minutes or something, that would be great. You know, I don't know. Um, and I think 
I think a little bit of, um, again, this is so hard cause I don't want to, I don't want to put more burden, but I think a little bit of like positive validation or can go a long way of, um, you know, and I, I just had this with when my grandma died and I was with a coworker, um, and I had, I chose to go into work the next day as a distraction and had a pretty, you know, rough day. I was kind of a, a hot mess for a lot of it, but was able to hide out in an edit suite. Um, and a, you know, coworker slash friend sat with me and, um, just let me cry and let me be, have my moments and didn't try to shut it down. Um, and later said, you know, I don't feel like I did much. And I was like, no, no, you did. Like, that's exactly what I needed was just like, let, like, you didn't make me feel bad about the tears. You didn't, you know, like that's the, you know, so I think even a simple word of encouragement, like, cause the, you know, the other side of that is like, your person's going to be feeling pretty crummy that they're not able to make you feel better. And again, you do not need to worry about that. You do not need to worry about, um, you know, making somebody else feel better. But I think in an effort for you to get the support you receive, even just a word like that, like, you know, if they're leaving, just saying, you know, thank you. Like you sitting with me meant so much because they're probably leaving thinking, Oh my God, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything. I didn't cook anything. I just sat there. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but I think just recognizing if somebody is, if somebody did get something right, um, you know, recognizing that not in a way that like, Oh, we need to be coaching and praising the other people, but in a way to really help shape that support that you're going to need. Yeah. Uh, I, I really want to affirm that because even something as small as thank you, that was helpful for me. Wow. I really needed that today. Thank mm-hmm. you for listening. Or even just, um, thanks for letting me rant or whatever it, it manifests into. I'm so glad I could sit with you and cry. You feel like a really safe person to me, like whatever, however it comes out, like whatever the quote unquote script is that you use. Yeah. I think that that positive reinforcement can be helpful because it's, you're not doing something, but it's a reassurance that you're doing something. (laughs) You're not doing something in the way that society would measure you doing something as in making somebody quote unquote feel better, but you're actually doing quite, quite a lot um, in sitting and being present. They don't have to be big things. Um, And I hold up to, yeah, my, my other grandma who died a few years ago, people are, I've said this so many times, a co another coworker of mine, when that happened, sent me like a one line email and just said, I'm really sorry about your grandma. That really sucks. And I still tell them like, that was the most perfect sympathy note I got because that's all I needed was somebody to validate. Like we were saying, it's like you invalidate your own grief. So I was sort of like, okay, this is my grandma. I shouldn't be as, I shouldn't have as hard a time with this as I'm having. And for somebody else to then say, no, you, you're allowed to have a hard time. Um, and I, you know, and I said, thank you. That was, um, that was perfect. Or yeah, sitting with someone like, it doesn't have to be a huge thing to be a huge thing, you know? I think we can also turn that inward on ourselves and allow ourselves to be the people supporting ourselves in our grief. I know it seems very like meta or a little surreal to be the person who allows ourselves to grieve. But even sometimes uh, I'll be sitting alone in my room with a notebook in my hand. I'm like, okay, you have permission to rant about whatever you want for 20 minutes. And I just like scribble down whatever on the paper. And I'm like, look, look how much better you feel (laughs) after doing that. And, and not, you know, trying to judge myself of like, oh, this is pointless or, oh, it's not going to change the behavior of this person, or it's not going to, um, it's not going to impact my day, but then having it all out somewhere without that judgment, um, that kind of sideways chatter that our brain often does and just letting it dump somewhere. I'm like, Oh, that was even helpful. So the ability to, to self witness can be really powerful too. And and self validate, like you have every right to feel whatever you're feeling And, and just backtracking that to the validation of the support you're getting too, is like, I think that's a big thing both, I guess, for someone who is actively grieving and for support person is like, you might not know what you need, you know, you might not know that thing that's going to feel good. I remember, so one of my other um, loss stories that happened a few, probably a year or so into this is I had a cousin who died when he was 23 of an overdose, very unexpectedly. Um, And I remember that night when I found out, um, you know, my husband first like was trying to be there for me. And I said, no, I just need, I just need to be in my room by myself. But that, you know, or he'd try to hug me and I'd be like, stop touching me. And then five minutes later, I'm like, wait, come back. I need a hug, you know, and it would change that quickly of just, um, 
you know, from, from minute to minute, it was like, I couldn't stand to be around anyone else. And then the next minute I so desperately just wanted another human there to hold me. Um, so I think for support people, just being flexible on that and that you might have to, so, you know, you might have to kind of roll with it. And then, you know, if you're grieving, I think it's um, that compassion with yourself. Like you don't have to have it figured out. Like you might, and, you know, we talk about that a lot in the project, but the whole problem with our support narrative of like, let me know if you need anything is like, well, some, you don't know, you don't always know what you need. So sometimes you just have to kind of offer and try some stuff and it might be hit or miss, but, um, you know, giving that compassion on both sides of it to, to be flexible and to, you know, kind of roll with it as you're figuring it out is important. Yeah. I think the only measure of failure in, in grief support is failing to show up. Mm -hmm. I think people think mm -hmm. if they can't make somebody feel better right away or give them exactly what they need or um, bring the right kind of dish or show up at the right time for a service that they failed, they're grieving person somehow. And I'm like, mm, the only failure is, is not showing up at all because some kind of effort, even if it's like 1% of effort, um, is, is not rewarded necessarily, but it's noticed. Like you, you know who sends you a card and who doesn't. You know who shows up for a service and who doesn't. You know who reaches out even, you know, across distances on the internet or, or over text or something and who doesn't. And so there's, there's a noticing on the part of the graver of who's trying, even if it's not perfect, who's trying. Who's trying and, and who continues to try? Yeah. Cause that's another huge thing that we're trying to put out there in the consciousness of this project is this ridiculous timeline that we some I don't even know where it came from but this whole like that there's some sort of this end point and this um this time magic time that you get to where um you know you've completed your process and you're not grieving anymore um you know and I think validating that for anyone who's listening who's actively grieving is like it's not a thing it you know you you love someone as long as you love them and that's how grief goes and it'll change and it'll get different, but it, it's not something you need to feel pressured to end. And then I think for supporters is we're really trying to get past that whole, okay, I brought a casserole in the first month after the funeral. And we've had so many people say too, even in that period, it's almost overwhelming if you, because you will get support a lot of times in this crazy whirlwind of, you know, two or three weeks and then it vanishes. And so for a support person side of just like recognizing like, yeah, absolutely show up in that first month, but keep showing up. Like don't, it's not over. And, and I think too, like we think that it has to be this spontaneous support. Like I'll be real. Like when I have grieving people in my life, I put reminders in my calendar on random days, you know, every three months I'll just set myself a reminder, like, Hey, check in with this person or, you know, depending on my relationship with them, especially people that maybe aren't in my daily interactions or that I don't see that much that it would trigger me remembering them. Um, I will set reminders for myself and people will be like, Oh, well that's, that's inauthentic. You need a Google reminder. I'm like, well, no, it's not because I had the intention to set that reminder and the, you know, the, the reaction that it prompts in me to reach out to them or send them a card or send them a text is genuine. It's just like, we all have our lives and we all have and stuff moves. And again, you know, you don't always see people every day and, and it's not that you don't still have that care for them. Like there's absolutely nothing shameful about um, being intentional about remembering your people. I think you're absolutely right in that that brings into light the role of intention. It's like, what energy am I coming to this with? And as long as the energy is, this is important, this matters. I think that the way that it's executed is marginal doesn't really matter all that much but as long as the energy uh coming from it is is i care about this like this really really is important to me um even if you have to set a calendar reminder i'm like yeah i do that <laughs> um it, it makes such a big difference and even putting people's grief anniversaries and stuff into my phone or or um mm -hmm. put my google calendars is, is really helpful and even to put my own grief anniversaries in there. Cause sometimes it's mm, been so long sometimes mm. I'm for the first time this year and the year before I'm like, wow, I've forgotten my own grief anniversaries. And so to, to text my family or my sister or my aunts or whoever, um, on these days that are also big for me, uh, is, is really huge. Um, <laughs> it's like, uh, I have a calendar for all my work stuff and then you can toggle on an overlay calendar of grief. <laughs> <laughs> I love that 
that though, right? Because it's so real and so true. And that, you know, I think that's another whole, a whole other conversation, but that kind of dual role of being someone who's grieving and supporting again with my grandma, I had like, like, so my mom was the one who called me and, and told me she died. And I had my own breakdown in my car in the parking lot and was just cursing and punching the steering wheel and sobbing. And then like, it wasn't until I think that night or the next morning, my husband asked me, he's like, how's your mom doing? And I was like, Oh my God, like I'm a terrible person. I didn't even ask her. Like I was so in my own grief and I'm like, yeah, it was my grandmother, but it was her mother. And I, Oh my God, what kind of a crappy person am I? And, you know, and I told her that I was like, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't even, you know, I was just so overcome so that, you know, that's its own tricky space is like your grief with, you know, with the other people affected by that loss. Um, there's so many layers. There are. And sometimes I think that the people who, who best support us are not in our immediate family, especially if it's a familial loss, because we are so uh, consumed by our own stories and our own relationships to the person who died and our own uh, pain that it's not that we fail to reach out to other people, but it's just like we're carrying so much as is. And so there's almost this, um, we have to look outside of our, our core circles every now and then for, for support because the people who are around us are also grieving. So there's a big, um, it's very webby how, how much it stretches outside of us. And it's, it's often interesting who we end up leaning on. I, I speak to so many grievers and they're always, almost always surprised by who shows up and who doesn't and who becomes a friend in grief and who um, kind of gets cut off because of grief or a failure to show up in grief. Um, so I know we're ending, uh, cl getting close to the end of our time here, Lindsay. I wonder where can people find uh, the film Speaking Grief and uh, how can they access it, especially right now in the midst of quarantine? So speakinggrief.org is our website and there is a link there to find air dates. So it's airing on public media stations throughout the U.S., uh, but they're all different air dates. So we update that regularly as we get new air dates in. And there's also information there on how people can contact their own station and request that they schedule an air date if they don't have one yet. Uh, because this is public media that does matter when, when people take the time and reach out um, and a community shows, shows interest in a certain topic. So the, that's one way. And I also want to say the the project has all these different tiers. So there is the documentary, but then also on that website there are a lot more stories. There's a lot more video and there's a lot more information for both um, being on the grieving side of things and being on the support side. So I'd really encourage people to, to kind of sift through that. And then also on social media at WPSU grief, um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. We put out a lot of uh, material and information, both about broadcast, but also just about grief and grief support on those channels. So right now uh, the, the project will be airing, on stations. It's also available on PBS Passport, which is a PBS member function. And then later in the year, once kind of the preliminary run of broadcast has happened, uh, it will be uh, posted, made available on that speakinggrief.org site. And also in the interim, once <laughs> we're exploring, we had a lot of events planned that have gotten postponed, but we are making it available to any group, um, no matter how big or small. Um, or any organization that's interested in hosting a screening event and having, even if it's virtual and having a, you know, using it to prompt conversations about grief, there's a form on the website where people can find out more how to do that and request a copy of the film and we'll make it available for screenings. Beautiful. I love uh, that this is just going to be such a widespread occurrence. Like I feel like getting it out to so many public broadcasting stations across the country is going to be so immensely helpful, especially right now when all of us are grieving and supporting grievers in some way with radically different griefs, mind you. Um, but we are, we are. That's, that's the goal. We want to start the conversation. And the last thing I'll just say is, so we had our local premiere uh, on Tuesday. And even in the few days since that happened, it's been really great to see people take the time to reach out and share. You know, it's always great to hear people appreciate what you do, but people are sharing that it's prompted them to have conversations in their own homes, either, either you know, starting to think about their own grief or I've had people share that it's prompted conversations about, you know, maybe how they could have done better when they were trying to show up for someone else. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do is just open a conversation. Yes. Yeah. And that's all we ever really need to do with mm -hmm. grief is make room for it to show up and it will, it will. <laughs> yeah, it most definitely will. 
Yes, absolutely. So grief growers, if you have access to a public broadcasting station in your area, check out speakinggrief.org to find an air date near you and then wait uh, until 2021 when uh, it's going to be live online, sounds like. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us here on Coming Back today. Shelby, thank you so much for having me. It, It was a great conversation. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Lindsay Whistle Fenton for joining us to share the new documentary Speaking Grief and helping us normalize and navigate conversations about grief and loss. Lindsay came back by truly listening to the grief experiences of others and allowing conversations to be awkward without the need to fix them or make them anything different. You can find your local air date for Speaking Grief as well as more about the experts behind the documentary at speakinggrief.org and you can find that link in the show notes. If you'd like to get online grief support for just $3 a month, pledge to support this podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash Shelby Forsythia. You'll instantly unlock access to weekly grief guidance prompts and monthly live calls with me. Our next live grief support call is happening on Monday, June 22nd at 7 p.m. Central Time. Thank you so much this week to Connie for supporting Coming Back on Patreon. If you liked what you heard today, subscribe to Coming Back on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and tell a friend about Coming Back. Because you never know what someone you love is going through. Thank you to Addie Goldstein who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby Forsythia Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Shelby Forsythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or comment for a future show, email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you, I'm proud of you and the work that you're doing in the world, and I love you. Because even through grief, we are growing. We are growing.